Please join me in welcoming our presenter today, Angela Macris. Hi everyone, and thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with me. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, having the opportunity to present to you my version of why social media is a great tool for democratization of information. Um, but there's a few steps we need to follow to make sure that does happen. And I'll be going uh, talking about a few things. And at any point in time, if you want to know more information or you want something clarified, feel free to put something in the chat and, and not wait till the end of, of the presentation. And so on that note, um, I'll begin. So basically today's agenda is who am I? Um, what, um, putting social media into context and why social media is a tool and not a solution and how to use social media for engagement and inclusion and the tools you'll need to create a social media plan. This is all top line. And please note that if there's any more information you want as we go along, my email will be presented at the end and you can email and we can discuss things further. So basically I'm an Australian who uh, is living in the US, married to a, a US citizen. I am doing a PhD at the College of Public Health at University of South Florida. I am a USED trainee and my focus of my dissertation is uh, increasing active living in group homes for people with intellectual disability using social ma marketing and practice theory. But before I got here, I was basically employed in the marketing and communications industry in Australia and Greece, both as a marketer and in advertising agencies. I have a strong marketing communications background, which I have actually used quite a lot in, in my research which is important because we'll go through a certain elements that you need to do, which are also pertain to research, uh, which is lovely. And I also just described what my research is. And, and I also am, was an emerging leader for AUCD in 2019. So some of the work I did, um, and this is scanned, so it shows you how long ago it was, is basically I did a lot of multicultural communications. And this was for a pharmaceutical company. And the problem there was that, uh, Asian community were not used to, in traditionally the heritage was not about not going bald and basically anyone, any person from the Asian community that was going bald and we're talking Chinese, Vietnamese in Sydney, um, basically would buy Rogaine and they couldn't understand why. So they went to the pharmacy, pharmacies and, and asked the pharmacists, why are there so many people buying this product? And I said, culturally, going bald is, is a big no-no. So we, they saw that as a great opportunity to market this product further afield. And so it was the year of the horse at the year it was launched. And therefore, the, and, and the thing is it's four out of five people, one out of five people will go bald. That is the average. So therefore you have three horses with a lovely mane and one without a mane. And that was the one person who was going bald. And this is all culturally appropriate. And the, and the actual person who drew this was um, a, a Vietnamese art, art director from the agency. And this is the version for the Chinese New Year that was put out, of course, being in red. So this was aimed at the Chinese and Vietnamese community. And this campaign ran for about two years with, of course, the animals changing with the, the year of the hare, the year of the horse and so on and so forth. What that also followed through was then we went to further afield, and this is just describing how you can market to various communities um, in, in ways that are still um, branding and message on point. So here we are promoting Rogaine again, four out of five people um, won't go bald. And because we had a limited budget, we had to find a culturally relevant theme that can cross over Arabic speaking, Greek speaking and Italian speaking. And our research found that it was basically soccer that um, brought everyone together. So we bought the core concepts and we then amended it to the various cultural appropriate uh, papers at the time and also radio stations and point of sale. So these are the ads that were Greek on the right and Arabic on the left. And these are the point of sales that were actually in pharmacies. The English one is on the left and the Italian one is on the right. And within the packaging, they had, diff they had about seven different languages, uh, three of which we were promoting um, on the mainstream media, mainstream multicultural media. And so that's just an example of some of the work I was doing and you'll see why it's relevant as we go a bit further. And the other thing I did was for New South Wales government and public libraries, the, the problem there was that public libraries weren't visited by um, people who spoke English as a second language is how we, um, we um, categorize people 
with immigrants basically and and migrants so basically the issue of a public library in most countries didn't exist and those that had heard of them thought that there was a price to get in when actually they're free so we created a campaign with uh, the library uh, library of new south wales basically promoting the fact you can go to your local library it's free it's somewhere you can as it says here learn english borrow books in your own language and access the internet because a lot of people did not have access to the internet at that point in time and we had it in on a poster with various languages on the one page and also on um, billboards that look very similar to the the center one and also on train in train stations and they were positioned right near public libraries that were near public transport and uh, and that was done on purpose because most of the libraries had all these languages that um, are shown here and what they did was take a measurement of the library books that were borrowed before the campaign started during the campaign and about two weeks after the campaign to see if people actually came in and borrowed books and accessed and learned, and learned English because there was programs uh, that were free um, in the library and what they found was that basically there was an, a, a really big increase in Greek and Indian and I'm not sure what other language that were being borrowed, books were being borrowed and people coming to the library. And, and this is something because we basically found out what the problem was, use cultural appropriate messaging and images. These are all people from real people in the library and, 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 uh, and communicate to them in places that they would be. And, uh, and this was done and people go, well, how can this win an award, which it did against major agencies? And I say that because even the people who um, judged us didn't realize it. But I said, when you look at these posters, the first thing you read is the one that you can read, the English language one, if you're an English speaker. I read English and Greek, so my eyes go to both, you know, go to your local library and the second row from the top. And so when people saw the buses going past or the posters on the train, they immediately just saw what was related to them. And then they saw the, but the when they got out of the public transport, they saw the library in front of them. So it was, it was like information, action was in the the place was immediately there to take action so that is something which is also important when we use social media which i'll also um, allude to as we go along so it's very important to put social media in context we can't put the court the cart before the horse because we're pretty much going to go nowhere so it's important to note that social media is way down the list of at what point do you engage with social media? It, it, is, it has to be part of a, if it's not a marketing process, it's gotta be part of a planning process where you have to understand the, the mission uh, of, what your, uh, of your, what your department or even the program is wanting to do, the situation you're in, uh, the marketing strategy you wanna use, who is your audience, how are you gonna measure if this is getting out there, what do you want to say? How do you want to say it? And where do you want to say it? And at that point, social media becomes, you start thinking about social media. So we need to start with the basics. So you, but what is marketing? And marketing is, is either really well understood or very misunderstood. And uh, I'm hoping that this top line example where I relate it to social media will help you understand just the thinking you need to do to get behind a social media initiative that that can actually carry some weight and, and you can measure it effectively, excuse me, effectively. So basically what is marketing? It's an activity and a set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering and exchanging offers that have value for customers, clients, partners and society at large. So it's a process and activity that has value and you have to communicate, you have to deliver and there has to be exchanged. It's essentially what's in it for me. And why is it important? Because marketing as, as a thought and as a framework will help you make sure that you're, you reach, you, you have a goal, you have measurable objectives, you have a strategy about how to meet those objectives and you have the tactics, tactics of how to execute them. And that's again, where social media comes in because it is not the be all and end all, but used effectively, it can be a, a quite a strong tool. So, I'm going to frame social media with the classic four P's that is, um, that is marketing. And product refers to a good or a service that a company offers to customers. Ideally, a product should fall within, fulfill an existing consumer demand, or a product may be so compelling that consumers believe they need to have it and it creates a new demand. Putting that in a social media content, your product is basically your content, what you putting out in the social media arena. It is what you upload on your social media account and it is how you will be judged 
basically is on the product, which is the content. And is it important enough for me to actually engage in it? So that becomes the issue of price. Price is basically the cost a consumer pays for a product. In this instance, it is reading your content. Have you made that message engaging enough that they want to spend the time to access Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for your source of information? The price in this instance is their attention and the time they will provide to give you that attention you crave or crave you need when you have an outreach campaign. Place is when a company makes decisions regarding a place, they are trying to determine where they should sell a product and how to deliver the product in the market. So, in, so it's in front of the consumer that are, and they'll most likely buy it in our instances to read it. For social media, where will you have a presence? Where is the main, you know, your main group of people going to be? Is it Facebook? Is it Twitter? Is it Medium, which is a blog site? Is it Instagram? Is it TikTok? Is it a combination of both or three or four, depending on your message? This has to be understood very early on. Uh, so it makes the process of, of actually creating a social media plan and then managing that plan. And that also involves resources a lot easier. I mean, it's it's there's no one way to do it. It's just hopefully by knowing where to go to, uh, and there's a lot of data that will help you there, you will also know where to spend your energy because all these um, social media platforms are free. So everyone can use them. There's a lot of noise, as you will see. So it's important to, to stay focused and also be aware that it, you know, it might take a while to gain some traction. So which leads us to promotion, which includes, as we all know, advertising, public relations and promotional strategies to reveal to customers why they need to have it and why they should pay a certain price for it, which is reading and acting. For social media, this suite of resources available should not be used as a standalone tool, but part of a comprehensive outreach plan. And what I mean by that is that you send a Twitter message out or a Facebook message out asking people to follow this link to a presentation or to a paper because research is very important on social media now. You've got to make sure that all that back end is worked out and figured out before this actually goes out to the real world because once they click and it doesn't work, you pretty much lost them and they won't be back and they can't spread the message as well. So pretty much social media is the pointy end. Once you have all the back end worked out, where the paper will be uploaded, where the registration will be uploaded, where the, what you're asking them to do is um, fundraising. Uh, that is at that point, that's when you reach out and try and make contact. So again, what is social media? Because sometimes we forget and we get caught up with what our version of the, of the truth is. And the official word is that social media are interactive, digitally mediated technologies that facilitate the creation or sharing and exchange of information, ideas, careers, inter career interests, and other forms of expression via viral communities and networks. And that is very important because, I mean, even if you haven't been on Twitter or on TikTok or on Instagram, just others who have, is there's just a, such a sheer volume of activity going on that it can be quite perplexing and you can get lost in the noise. Uh, it is broad and relatively uncensored, which is both good and bad, as we've seen. And anyone with an internet can set up, access an account and create content. So there's a lot of people that have the ability to communicate. Some um, platforms are easier than others, but, the, but it's, there is no gatekeeper, as might be in usual um, media forms and outreach. So why is social media a tool? because it's an avenue to create, create or disseminate information from an already agreed upon strategy. It is a vessel for content to travel through to reach its final destination. And that's quite important. It is a vessel to get to who you wanna to speak to. And there's basically four types of social media. They're the social networks, which we all know uh, and are the most common where you connect with thought ideas and content, which is something like Facebook and Twitter. They're the media networks that specialize in distributing content like videos and photographs, such as Instagram and YouTube and TikTok. Then there are the discussion networks, which are outlets for posts that are ideal for in-depth discussions, such as Reddit and blog posts. And then there are the review networks, where you have you review products and services, such as Yelp and TripAdvisor. And so it's important, depending on what you're trying to do, to understand which networks you want to have a presence in at any point in time. I mean, it's not fixed. At some point, it might be the social. Sometimes it might be media and sometimes it might be discussion networks, but it's understanding that they all exist there and they should be used wisely. So 
this is just an example of the amount of conversation that can happen digitally. I mean, there's platforms within platforms within platforms, and there's learning platforms, listening and adapting platforms. So we're not going to talk about all that, but that's just the competition for someone's attention. And that is something that we all must um, remember when we create messaging and campaigns on social media. So again, this is an example of some of the data of the non usage of social media. And again, we're taking the big guns here, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. And this was taken up until the end of 2019. The, the data I think for 2020 would look vastly different just because of the sheer lockdown uh, where people just started using social media platforms in a way that they'd never used it before. But I felt this was a bit more indicative of, of, of life when there are other things um, trying to get your attention. And we can see basically that YouTube has a, a, a quite a large reach up to the 60, you know, 18 to 64 is quite prominent. Facebook again goes to 18, even to 65 plus. So that's, that, that hits you know, a, a pretty much the majority of the population. Instagram is skewed towards the younger, as is Snapchat and as is Twitter, which is no mean feat and it's not a surprise, but it's interesting again, when you want to send a message or you want to communicate, which channel you will use and why it becomes paramount when you know who are the who are the major users of that platform. And again, we've got the social media platform in the US. We've got YouTube and Facebook, pretty much used by both males and females um, the most, and WhatsApp, which and Reddit used by hardly I mean, much less men and women. And that again is an interesting fact to know when you're trying to position yourself as to where you can communicate. And I haven't actually mentioned WhatsApp and, and Viber as major communicators as well, because in America, they might not be major disseminators of information, but they definitely are overseas, uh, where a lot of government de departments are promoting um, their COVID messaging through WhatsApp and Viber, because that is the most um, used platform in countries outside of the US. So we get to the point of engagement and inclusion. Basically, engagement and accessibility in social media and is, is a great tool for people who are deaf. I've had you, there are many blog posts by deaf journalists who find the, the accessing social media as being an avenue to communicate and reach out to like-minded people. Those that have difficulty um, speaking and are unable to speak, those that practice, uh, have struggle with um, struggle with socialization, and meeting, communicating with other disabled people, you don't feel so alone if you're not able to actually get out of the house. You, it also is a tool for storytelling, and we've seen that a lot. Um, as special books by special special kids, special books by special kids. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Get it get right. He tells stories of people with multiple disabilities of from different parts of the world, from different parts of the U.S., and and he tells he lets them tell their story, and that is something that started. And he's from Jacksonville, from Florida. And there's, I've got his um, information a bit further down, but he started because they wouldn't print his book on, on, on uh, children with special needs because he's a special needs teacher. And so he started posting photos with stories on Facebook. And that grew because, you know, like-minded parents and, and were sharing these stories so they would realize that they weren't alone. The group got bigger. He went from photos to videos where, you know, people, siblings were talking about their, their, um, their brothers or sisters, parents were talking about their children, the people themselves where they could were discussing about their disabilities and he covers everything. And he, you know, he does a three minute or two minute upload on Facebook, then the full stories on YouTube and, and again, snaps of that on Instagram. So he has about 6 million followers on YouTube. And that is very impressive because it, it reaches people that none of us can reach if we try to do it in, in any other medium. And he's reaching people, telling real stories by real people. And that in itself is, is, is something that mainstream publishing people would never had said would work. And he's a great example and, and, I'll, and you'll see why a bit later on. So it is also um, ability to participate in protests and campaigns on accessibility issues. There's a lot of noise you can make if you all have the same hashtag. And, uh, and it's also helpful for accessing information services that are not available to you locally. If you're a caregiver and you're not able to, to go to certain um, health out, uh, uh, healthcare uh, or services that are basically available, if they are able to 
to promote it either on Facebook or on, on Twitter or somewhere where it's easily accessible, even on your phone, it might help just to reach, get a, that outreach that um, a pamphlet might not be able to get, or someone can't go to the emergency services to pick up some information if something like a hurricane is happening here in Florida. Uh, the legal aspects of disability and access to media sites is that link there, which um, we, we can all copy at some point, but it basically has the accessibility resources and a need to know when you're setting up um, social media sites. So it's more of a, a legal aspect. What, um, what social media is accessible? AUCD a few months ago did a very great um, webinar on how you can make certain sites accessible. So I'm not going to repeat it here. Um, basically the most accessible sites because they consciously have um, ways to make uh, for those that are hard of hearing, hard of seeing, um, they don't cover all the disabilities, but they cover more than most, is Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Now, the tools to make your posts more accessible, there's this great, um, uh, great guide um, that the link is here that tells you, you know, what you need to do to make your post on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter more accessible. And that in itself uh, will just help that outreach. And, um, and Again, if anyone wants more information, just feel free to email me because this is a very easy guide to do that. And, and, and I thought I'd just put that out there in case people wanna look for it a bit further. So the advantages of using social media um, are also academic because there's many people in the um, UCED, LEND, AUCD network that publish fabulous papers, uh, wonderful research, and, and it's a great way to disseminate all that information to one, get other researchers to be able to, uh, to work and collaborate to get more citations. I mean, that is also a great way of getting citations. Twitter has now become like an academic hub for promoting your papers and looking for like-minded researchers. It is also a great way to, um, for outreach um, for targeted communities and people and um, because there are no gatekeepers and the use of a hashtag or an at, well, I'll explain a little bit further, will get you knocking on the door of people that you might not normally be able to access, uh, both as, as someone with a disability or someone just trying to change a policy or someone just trying to make noise because they want the, the, you know more accessibility in certain services. So we come to the point of where do we want to be, you know, as as a as a training center, as a as a as a project that has to be dis, um, communicated to the outside world. Do we want to be a creator, which is creating original content, such as the CDC and AUCD? Do we want to be a curator, which is a value add, where they basically take all this information and say, okay, out of the twenty things that are could be in your inbox today, the one that is the most relevant are these three. They curate the content on the subject matter that is relevant to you. And AUCD does a lot of that with the special interest groups. Um, disseminator is those that just find the, the appropriate link and just pass it on. You know, they share a video they might have seen, a link they might have seen, and they just, just pass it through the vessel to the next audience. So you are now going from the pool of people that you, you were told, and then you then tell the other pool of people and so on and so forth. Or do you want to be a disruptor and use this medium for lobbying and advocacy? Not everyone can do that, of course, here because of um, the public and private nature of certain areas, but it is used a lot and it should be also considered if you're trying to do something that could be lobbying, that could be seen as lobbying and advocacy, or you want other communities to do some. And then this is a great medium to get a lot of voices to create one loud roar. So a creator, and these are some examples from Facebook, is Special Books by Special Kids, which he, as I said, creates content, original content. And you also have the CDC that creates its own content and uploads it onto Facebook. Then you've got the curator, and these are, um, and they also can be curator and content creator, so they can straddle both things, is the American Association of Intellectual and Disab Developmental Disabilities and Kaiser Health News, who curates information and delivers it to you because you have shown interest in this area, whatever it may be. Then there's the disseminator, and I hope you can see that. This is a tweet 
from disability statistics that basically in the, the red outline is it is just retweeted something that they found in another tweet and they want to disseminate it further afield. So basically it just said, yeah, we like it, we're going to pass it on. And then there's the disruptor, uh, which is basically a movement of sorts, depending on, on, on one instance, like nothing about us without us, hashtag, has a series of various things that are happening across the globe because it's not US specific, that is aimed at, at promoting uh, disability rights. So if you want to get into that environment and that noise, and I mean that in the best possible way, you hashtag nothing about us without us. If you want to be also a disruptor, you do something that Vogue did uh, in um, about, you know, the strongest, the, the change maker list and had, and I can't, oh my God, I can't remember her name, but she is a great, she is a, a wonderful advocate for disabilities on social media. And she was also retweeted by Andy Impanaru when he was, uh, um, because he's also a great advocate for disability. So his network then spread that word. So it's just like, it's just like a wonderful trickle, one dot, then it just spreads out to more. So, and this is the way you can also use it. Now, where you want to sit and how much percent you want to be curating, um, content creating, disrupting or uh, disseminating, it depends also on the resources you have. Uh, you can't be all things at once, but that sometimes you might be one more than the other. So, so how do we put this into practice? Basically, you need to see what your resources are because this looks really easy, but is quite a full-time job. So you need to have someone or various people to create the content or even find the content, monitor the sites, post a schedule and analyze the process and process, analyze process, and you need a, the skill set and you need management commitment. And I've done, I've done it myself and I've done it with others. It is a full-time job just trying to find content that's relevant, create content that's relevant, because remember, a message can't be just uploaded, it has to go through a few checks and balances. And that process has to be fixed, factored into when you're creating a, a social media plan. So you need to have an objective. Do you have a plan? Are you, as I said, a creator, a curator, a disseminator or a disruptor? And at some point, as I said, you might be all four or 20%, 10%, zero and 60. Uh, how many social media channels do you wanna use? to start now and then build in the future. You don't have to start with all of them now. You might want to just put your toe in the water with maybe Facebook or you want to put it with, with Twitter, which is a, the, the different mediums, of course, but they are a start so you can get some experience and then venture further afield. Um, is the content aligned with a call to action? Is it supporting or promoting a resource? Is that resource uploaded and ready to use? So when you do say, here it is, people can find it. And also, are you aware of the hashtags used to help promote what you're trying to disseminate? And do you have social media accounts you specifically want to target instead of just a spray and pray approach, which is just, let's just hope someone reads it. And these are all things that, again, I refer back to when I said about the marketing plan, you need to have a, a rationale that we're going to follow this path so we can basically get the medium, the communications we want. So, it also is important, as I said before, to pick where you want to be wisely. And this is a, pretty much a resource issue, issue. You know, AUCD, as you see on the bottom of every web page, is how to contact us. They have two Facebook accounts, a Twitter account, a LinkedIn account, a YouTube account, Instagram account, Flickr account, and RSS account, which is pretty much ticking every box from the a content creator to the, dis, or not so much the disruptor, but yes. Uh, so, but this all has to be manned and managed by someone or a, a, a bunch of a whole set of people. So therefore they have the resources to be able to do that. Here at the um, Florida Center for Inclusive Communities, we have got social media. We have a, a list on our, pay, uh, on our website of where, uh, what our commitment is to social media. And we basically all pages have a Facebook page. Some have Twitter, a few have Facebook and one has Instagram because this is where we've picked and choose what mediums would work best for the intent we have. And it, this is something that can change over time. It's not set in stone, but when you start with at least one objective or start with one medium, um, you can have the ability to test it out, uh, see how it goes, see, just basically understand this way of communicating a little bit better. So let's get to work and see how, 
sorry. Me, this is Maureen. Um, yes. I just want to point out a question in the chat box from yes. Megan Clark. Uh -huh. She asked, um, are you able to touch on analytics, for example, Facebook views versus reach? Thank you. Yep, that's coming down the track. You beat me to it. That's great. Thanks. Because <laughs> um, that's also very important and something that is quite uh, one of the big pluses of being uh, on social media is the analytics component. So basically, where do we start? There are two elements. Well, and, and basically three, there's the calendar and the content. And then there's the mindset. You have to be okay with losing control of the message because once this thing goes past a certain point and it's retweeted or forwarded or shared, it's lost. It's somewhere out there, but it's okay if the content is great. Now, that is something most people aren't used to because they're used to controlling the message and the channels, but you've got to be okay with letting it go. Um, and, and if your message is fine and it's on point, then that's great. The problem arises when there's a mistake being made in the account or the information presented. Retrieving that can be quite hard, I'd say next to impossible. So then you'd have to get a new message out to basically over, you know, cancel out the other one because, and that's why it's important because that's, it's not like a TV ad that we used to just take down or a print ad, you can stop the run or a radio ad where you just can basically just, you know, stop it from being played. It's not like a print ad where the pamphlet can be recalled and you just, re, you know, reprint and send them out again. Not that that's any better, but it's still a, a controllable medium. Whereas this is not a controllable medium, which is why you really need to have all your ducks in a row before you get that message out because um, you don't want to get it wrong because you'll never be able to get that message back. And you also will promote um, wrong messaging and that's the last thing you want to do. And you won't be able to see who's seen it and how they've reacted to it. So the easiest place to start because you can control the messaging is the text and the links, being a creator and then curate for backup content. So basically, these are the options you have when you create a message. You can have the owned media, which is as you, you create either videos, webinars, visual content, podcasts. You get paid media where you've got your um, your message and you actually get it's paid to be shared to people or people or groups that are very targeted. It's literally like a paid ad and it's not organic. And the difference between organic is you send it to five people, they send it to other 10 and then it amplifies. The paid ads is that it is amplified from the start. You pay uh, an amount that is is quite reasonable, which is the beauty of uh, social media. It's not an expensive medium to get some traction in. And, you know, you say, I want to reach women 35 to 40 who access Facebook pretty much in the afternoon and they will, the algorithm will do that. It is that it can be that specific when you get paid advertising on social media. You can, you know, pay for a certain hashtag to always be out there, pin it to the top things that just always will get the message across in a, in a such an, an acute and accurate way that it is impossible with any other medium. So that is also worth investigating. And the budgets don't have to be in the thousands. They could be like 60, 80, a hundred dollars, 200, 300. And it, the spends aren't that huge compared to what is considered mainstream advertising. And, and then you've got, you know, who you want to communicate. Do you want an, someone who is an advocate for a cause or someone who is a researcher who's well known in that area that you want them to participate, get them to, you know, help with the dissemination. Earned media is again when people pick this up and promote it, such as the media might pick up some movement that is happening and promote it. That is, that is rare, um, but it does happen on, on just more basic campaigns that are more outreach. And it's, of course, your shared media is where you you pick people to actually act as your ambassadors to generate content. Um, and then you'd have partnerships, but that's also a form of branding. So the content you create is a little bit of what suits you, but the best and the easiest way to start working is your own media, which is that green ball down the bottom, where you create content based on research findings, programs you're conducting, the findings of those programs, you know, events that are happening in your local area or that you're promoting as part of the network uh, and then start to see the traction. So part of that is understanding the difference between a hashtag and an at. So a hashtag is pretty much dissemination to a group of like-minded individuals. So there's the hashtag that always goes first and then you have a series of words or a word. 
And here is an example of um, this site has a set of both ads, which is a person's name, a, a person who's actually registered on Twitter or a company that goes directly to them. So on, the, on where it says accessible, they have a whole bunch of ads. So they're going to specific people and specific organizations. And then you have here the hashtag, which is choose to challenge, which is the movement that they're promoting this within. So you've got the movement, which is um, choose to challenge. And then you've got the people they want to outreach to for this message listed here. So it's exceptionally specific. And that can be done with any tweet and any Facebook, any Instagram, anything on social media. If you don't know what um, a hashtag would you could use, you can actually go in and just press, you know, go onto the internet, press on the subject hashtag disability, and, and you'll see a whole set of, of, of um, articles come up. Or you might press developmental disability or, or like I did a campaign last year for domestic violence and there were specific, uh, specific hashtags for um, Stop DV 2020. That was for the whole month. So these things gain traction because there's a lot of noise and a lot of people promoting various um, messaging. So that hashtag, it gets everyone who has the, the same mindset to actually be exposed to this message. Again, the amount of information being uploaded is, is a lot and constant. So you can't just do it once and expect everyone to see it. It has to be daily. Sometimes it could be hourly if it's coming to an, a deadline because you know, within, you, if you press refresh, you'll, yours will be lost about 20 messages down. So you, it's, it's also about timing. And if it's in that person's um, the at sign, they have more of a chance of seeing it. But then again, when you're bombarded with so much information, if they don't open it or access that point in time, it might be harder for them to, to, to read it. And here's another one where it was um, DD Awareness Month, which is now. And so you've got the Awareness Month, which is the, the group, the community, and then here it's DD Awareness 2021, so it's for this year. And here are the other groups that are being targeted. Here we have AUCD News, NACED, and Community Living. And so there's a Community Living is, again, the like-minded group. This is targeted to AUCD News, so it will appear on their feed. And that's another way of, of extending your voice. So understanding the use of hashtags and ads is, is very important. And what I usually ask of, of big meetings when we do them in-house is I ask people who have Twitter accounts to actually just give me their Twitter account. So I can use them as, as, a, as an extra ambassador for the voice. And, you, and, and then you can say, okay, our hashtag for this project is hashtag and whatever you wanna call it. Don't make it too long. And then press that hashtag and see if anyone else is using it and how, and how they're using it because it could be to a product or a service or something you don't want to be associated with, and they're quite popular. So your voice will get lost in, in, in that hashtag environment. So this brings me to the competition worksheet, which you can do. You have your keyword or your hashtag, and you see, I mean, you don't do it that detail, but you see who's posting, where are they from? How many posts do they have? Uh, is it in competition with what I'm doing or is it complementary to what I'm doing? If I do um, hashtag DD, is that too vague? So I get a whole bunch of other things that doesn't really impact what I'm trying to do. You know, how specific do I have to get to be able to, to understand that my audience is actually the one I'm looking for? And that takes a little um, getting used to playing around, looking at um, other uh, centers that are on uh, the social media and looking how what hashtags they use and being guided by them in the first instance. That would help also looking at um, the, you know what, there's no real competitors. Everyone's you know trying to make a better life for everyone. But seeing what tools other people use or other um, uh, educational institutions use to be able to promote the message and learn from them and build on that because this thing is shifting sand. It's always going to be different. Some hashtags are going to have more momentum than others. That doesn't mean you don't use them. It's just understanding if something didn't go as planned there's a maybe a reason for it and maybe there just isn't and and that's another hard thing to understand if you're a, a research scientist and you want you know empirical evidence you probably won't get it um so you have your weekly social media content this can be done in an excel spreadsheet um and it's very easy to do you have basically 
this great version of you know what you put on Twitter, what you put on LinkedIn, if these are the mediums, you just basically then swap them out for the mediums you'll use and what you'll post, post every day. You might not post every day, uh, but when you do, you post well. Like you might not, LinkedIn doesn't need daily posts. It might do a good weekly post because the very nature of, of the social media. Uh, Twitter needs pretty much daily, hourly, every half hour. It is the most, it's like a, just walking in a city full of people. You just got to keep moving because if you don't, you'll someone will trip over you because the, the other Twitter will go up. Blogs are far more engaging. So, you, you know, you put them up maybe once a week or twice a week, depending on the content, because that's, that makes, you know, it's, it's aimed at a very different audience and it's for those that seek to have a discussion and to analyze. And so there might be some projects or some findings that you find might be appropriate. AAIDD, I remember last year when it had to go virtual and a lot of people couldn't attend or they couldn't get the exposure, took a lot of the posters from the conference and put it on Medium, which is a blog, and they created their own page where they uploaded all these posters and then provided some insight from the research. And that exposed the research to a set of people that might not even know AAIDD exists. And so that is, you know, you've got the posters already digitized. You just, you know, get the, the the author to write something that's a little bit more engaging and you create a, a post that is there forever. And when someone, you know, looks for something or searches something, it might come up. So blogs are a great way to promote, especially now with this environment being virtual and, and so much um, and people just looking for content or looking for something that's a little bit different uh, to promote information from research. Um, Medium is also, and they had their own page, so it was dedicated. It wasn't just a post that was just going to go. Uh, so that was, I think, a very smart use of existing research to disseminate in a way that previously people might not have thought of in the research world. And, and that is why I think it's important to, to, to see which medium can help you in, in for, depending on your, your needs and your reach. So we get to the bit of the analytics. Uh, basically, every medium has an analytics page. You go to it, you press it, and it'll give you a whole set of information. And basically, you know, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. Does it marry well with a certain post? Because you'll also get a set of posts. This is Facebook. You get a set of posts that have how many people engaged with it, how many people shared it, if anyone commented. And you'll see from that list, which is long, it's like 35, 40 posts are, po are set up on, on one screen, you'll see which one's got the most engagement. Was it the topic area? Was it that it had a photo? Was it because it was talking about someone in particular in the community that people liked? Um, photos always work better than plain content. Videos work better than photos and so on and so forth. Because uh, people want to be engaged. That's more Facebook. Twitter it does have engagement, but it, it also has content. And because the content is so sharp and short, uh, and then you go to the link, um, it, it, it's a different beast. And so you might get them in initially with a, an image, but there has to be a link to something more. Uh, and so basically someone asked me, what is the difference between engagement and reach? Was that the question, Maureen? Yes, that's correct. Okay, reach is pretty much who saw it. It went, you know, it was posted and it got to, you know, 30 people, let's say. Engagement is who interacted, did they comment, did they pass it on? And, and so therefore that is, is reach is basically, yeah, I saw it, but did I do anything with it is where the engagement comes in. Did I pass it along? Did I comment? Uh, did I like it? Uh, and so that is, is where your true stats lie because you can get a whole bunch of people saying, yeah, it, it reached a thousand people, but they just saw it. But who engaged with the, the, the content? Who engaged with the link? Did they follow through? And this is something that all the analytics can give you um, from all the mediums, which is something that costs nothing. Uh, and, and you can do it a monthly or weekly or basis, depending on, on the needs and, and what you're posting. And this will also help you track. So basically we also have responsiveness, 78% responded. How long did we take to respond to someone's message we, or, or a comment? It took two hours and you know nearly three hours. Is that good? Not really but this isn't a page that has a lot of traction. Usually people want to, if they have, if they reach out to you as, as, a, as, a, as a Lend program or a USED program, they want to go, they want to know you're replying within at least 10, 15 minutes. Cause that is unfortunately the speed of people expecting a reply because of the immediate nature of the medium. So that's why you need to understand 
how much you're going to engage with this medium because you need to someone to monitor if someone's commented something which isn't great or commented a query that they want something, an update on the information or want to know where else they can get something. They're not expecting your reply tomorrow. It, and so therefore that's why you need someone to be there to monitor and reply in a way that will um, will work for everyone, which is why it's, it's far more labor intensive than most people think. And um, so um, this is like the second last slide. So before you embark on this journey, there's a few things that you need to consider. And the first and foremost, is management okay with a channel of communication? Because someone has to approve what's going out. And at some point it might be every day, at some point it might be okay, Angela knows enough, we'll let her go a bit more. Um, what roles do you said or LEND have and what programs or projects do you want to disseminate? You know, not everything is social media content. Not everything will work on social media. And if some things work on one um, platform, it might not work on the other. So your experience is great with this because the more you, you see, the more you know. And again, as users, you will also have some gut instinct of what you, you know, you, people tend to gravitate towards when they want certain type of information. The most important is, do you know your audience, uh, who it is and the best place to find them? And as I showed some of the data, there's a lot of data. There's not a lot of data with um, uh, social media and disability use. There is some data, but it's a bit old, but it's, a, it's as good as it's gonna get at this point. Uh, I, I think with 2020, I'm hope there's more research come out, uh, but to date, I haven't seen a lot. Um, do you have the resources to, to maintain this initiative? As I said, people want responses. If you're on Facebook, which is more interactive than Twitter, then you're gonna need someone to monitor the chats, the communication, just to, to, to make sure it, 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 you're answering and also no one's in there saying things you don't want. Um, and do you have content people want to access? You know, you have to be a bit of a hard taskmaster. Is this interesting enough? And if it is, to whom? Uh, and do you have a schedule of content? Um, and do you know what will be uploaded and when? Because if you don't, you'll end up forgetting to post or post things that aren't relevant or just kind of just forget. And that's very easy to do because it's, it, it takes a lot of labor. And if someone's not dedicated, then, you know, those daily posts won't actually be achievable because there's no one there basically to monitor and do them. And, uh, and again, are you able to monitor the online activity? This is exceptionally important, as I said, because of the chats and sometimes you, in blog posts, you'll have conversations, you need that to be monitored, you need someone dedicated with responses, you need to have a standard responses ready in case someone says something that is, is not correct, whether politically or legally. Uh, and, and these things have to be thought about beforehand. So when the time comes, you've already got the message ready and who's ever monitoring that day can respond in due time. Because if they have to go up a level or two and these people aren't available, the opportunity may be lost to communicate with the person who's actually causing the grief. Um, so basically, I'd like to thank you for, for taking the time and uh, on a Friday afternoon and, and listening to me. My email is angelamacris at usf.edu. I'd be more than happy to anyone to reach out to me and I can give them more detail, more resources, uh, and, and, and just help anyone with any queries they may have. So I'm, I'm happy to take questions for anyone who might have any at this point in time. Angela, I have a question. Yep. Um, this is Megan from the University of Alaska. Um, uh, do you have a template for reporting out? Uh, for example, uh, participants and how that translates across the different mediums as I'm just thinking of like HRSA, for example. So how many yeah. people have, and, and what does that look like? Yeah, I've got some, cause I actually had to do reports for HRSA myself. <laughs> Or, um, maternal child health when um, I was working at um, uh, the Center of Excellence here at the, at the College of Public Health in, in South Florida. So I can send uh, send to, to Maureen, I can send all these resources and she can send them out. Would that be something that would be working for everyone? Because I can send out a lot of resources. It's just that putting these links on webinars doesn't really work. So, so I can send a whole suite of information so the, the more you want, just let me know and I can basically have that, uh, send that information to Maureen and she can just disseminate. So. 
Right. That sounds great, yeah. um, Angela. I can definitely add those resources to the event page for this mm -hmm. webinar. Mm -hmm. I did want to point out another question in the chat box from mm -hmm. Kara uh, Klein. Do you find Facebook groups effective? Why is it so hard to track those analytics using the tools they provide or via Hootsuite? Oh, yeah, Hootsuite's a funny medium. Um, if you're not paying for it, it doesn't really help you very much. And you can do two accounts for free on Hootsuite, which is probably the most people do because then it can get quite expensive. Um, Facebook private accounts are very hard because the fact that they are private, they're not public pages. Uh, they're more, uh, I've done surveys with um, people in, in, in public, in, in, for public health reasons from Facebook groups. And they're just, they're, they're more chat groups. It's, it's, unless you've got like a, it's, it's hard to say because they're private. They're not aimed for communication and they, you can't get the data because you're not accessing the site. So the, the data you have is pertaining to the site you own. You can't really look at someone else's data. So I own or I manage, I'm an editor for four pages on Facebook. I can go in and look at the analytics in far more detail than someone who's just viewing it. So it all depends who's the manager and who's the administrator of the page. And is that person the administrator of the page? Do they have access that, um, that allows them to look at data with a lot more depth than someone who's just there? Because that is also something important to figure out. Great, thank you. Um, any more questions, feel free to put your question in the chat box or you can also unmute yourself and um, say aloud your question. And I see that Tara Klein responded um, to your question, Angela, and she said, yes, she is the um, page admin. Okay, well, let me follow through and I'll get back to you. We have a couple more minutes left in this webinar. Um, please feel free to put your comments um, in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and say aloud. Again, I want to um, thank Angela Macris so much for this presentation. Uh, this was a webinar sponsored by the National Training Directors Council. Um, and for this webinar content, we also have our um, NPD care item. Hi everyone, this is Eileen McGrath. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today and especially thank Angela for such a valuable and informative webinar. It's been very helpful. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for the opportunity. Give it a couple more seconds to get any more questions. If not, then we will um, start concluding this webinar. Please um, complete the post um, event survey. It's in the chat and it will also be disseminated out to all participants in about a week as well. So if you miss it in the chat, um, I will also send it out. So I see no more um, questions, just a lot of thank yous um, to Angela and that she is you know, a proud um, USA trainee at the FCIC Center, as you can tell from her background. Uh, so again, thank you so much for um, attending this webinar. Um, we, this webinar has been recorded and will be archived. Um, before I go, I do see another question coming in um, from Darla. Um, I would love to have a follow-up at some point on more specifics to analytics for each of these platforms. Maureen, this yeah. is this is Megan from um, the Center for Human Development in Anchorage. I would I would love for there to be a group uh, focused on analytics. If there was any way that a group of us would be able to get together, because I I share similar challenges. Yeah, that is a great um, request. Maybe we can. Um send out a, a request or, or have something in the future, but um, I love that idea. Hi, this is um, Ariana 
from AECD. I'm the communications assistant. Um, that's a really good idea, Megan. And I forget who else just said that. Um, I will look into um, setting that up. Uh, Thanks so much, Ariana. And um, this is Eileen McGrath. We can certainly help through the National Training Directors Council in um, sending information out and helping get this group established and working. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, if there's no more questions, we will conclude this webinar. Um, have a great rest of your Friday. And please um, complete the post um, event survey in the link. Thank you, everyone.